All right. Welcome to the Oregon Center for Public Policy. Uh, this is our uh, webinar on income inequality. My name is Alejandro Queral. I'm executive director. Um, and uh, today we're going to have uh, a panel presentation um, with our policy analyst, Daniel Hauser, uh, and uh, Juan Carlos Ordonez, our uh, director of communications, uh, to uh, discuss uh, the paper that we recently published uh, uh, on income inequality. Some of you may have had the opportunity to read it. Today, we'll have an opportunity to focus on the data and the results of our analysis and to engage with uh, some of you in a conversation uh, we will have an opportunity to ask um, questions uh, from and, and address questions from the audience. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Oregon Center for Public Policy, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, research uh, and advocacy organization that focuses on economic policy uh, that benefits uh, uh, low-income communities. Uh, and we strive uh, to advance equity and to enable the success of those working to dismantle inequity through our work. Um, and so we publish uh, uh, and analyze uh, data um, with information that is essential to achieve the policies that will um, advance economic justice. Today, uh, we're going to talk about a topic that is critical uh, on this uh, conversation. Uh, and we find ourselves at a critical moment in our uh, nation's history. Uh, we are going through a painful process, not only of uh, dealing with a, a global pandemic uh, and the economic pain, but also a reckoning uh, of our racist past and uh, a recognition that many of the policies that we work on uh, day in and day out um, have been designed uh, to uh, ensure uh, that white supremacy reigns and that um, uh, those uh, that are uh, the beneficiaries uh, will uh, continue to um, derive the most benefits from this economy, and we seek to change that. So we believe this is a moment when fundamental transformation is possible. Uh, we believe that income inequality is a per pervasive feature of the economic structures, um, and uh, that these uh, structures can be altered through policy change. It has certainly led to the conditions that have made communities much more vulnerable, as we are seeing uh, from the effects of the pandemic and the recession. Uh, income inequality has put at a disadvantage many communities, the low-income communities, communities of color, uh, and the impact uh, is disproportionately affecting them. Similarly, uh, the economic recovery has not been equally shared uh, among um, the entire public, uh, the entire working public. Um, it is, uh, broadly speaking, uh, one in which white-collar workers uh, are doing better uh, because they're able to work from home and, frankly, face better prospects of recovery than essential workers, blue-collar work, uh, blue workers, and other frontline employees. So as you listen to the information that we will be presenting today, um, I think it's worth asking ourselves, what are the implications for our communities, our society, and our form of government? And what are the kind of policy changes that we ought to be striving for that will address the inequities that are embedded within the system? Um, so I will uh, uh, let uh, our policy analyst, Daniel Hauser, uh, take the first crack uh, at the presentation. Um, and then I will uh, moderate the conversation. Uh, I will ask uh, a couple of questions of our panelists. And then um, we will read some of the questions that you will submit. And I invite you to submit your questions. Uh, by link, uh, clicking the button at the bottom of your uh, uh, page, uh, this Q&A, uh, and we will read uh, the relevant questions as they appear. So please do so. Uh, I think we have disabled chat, so uh, uh, please don't, don't look for that, the Q&A. So with that, I am going to turn it over uh, to Dan. Thanks, Alejandro. I appreciate that introduction. And we've for many of you who have been long-term uh, OCPP followers, you'll know that we frequently come back to this analysis, come back to this question about income inequality. Uh, and we generally utilize the data provided to us directly by the Oregon Department of Revenue. And so we use the most recent data available from, uh, in this case, it'll be the 2018 tax year. Uh, and as you go through this and just, just a few kind of disclaimers and, and uh, uh, data points to help you kind of interpret and understand what we're saying. Uh, but that's where the data comes from and the taxpayers are really the, the unit of analysis. So when I talk about um, a median Oregonian or the richest people in Oregon, we're talking about taxpayers, tax filers, and that could be a single person, a family of six, et cetera. 
Um, so something important to keep in mind as we work through this. Also, because we're using data from people's tax forms, uh, they don't mark, and, and I'm sure many of you realize this now, that you don't actually mark your race or ethnicity on your tax form. And so we don't have data that we would like to have to really analyze and talk about and describe differences and in inequalities by race based on income. Uh, data sets that are available um, are usually survey data, like from the census, and they do find that here in Oregon, there are large disparities um, for things like median income. For example, white households uh, have higher median incomes than black or Latinx households. Uh, and much of that did not happen by accident. It's the result of generations of racist structures and discriminatory policies. And we really hope to explore that in future publications and future webinars. Um, but just know that that will not be uh, very present in the data that we're presenting today. And the last piece is that we also aren't going to be talking about wealth, right? Because we're using people's uh, data on their income from their tax forms, we don't have information on the level of wealth that they're holding, uh, which is even you know, quite a bit worse uh, than the income inequalities uh, in that Oregon faces. So the first slide um, and the first chart we're going to talk about is really looking at the gap between the um, top 1% and the median income Oregonian, right? And so what we have here in the state is that the average income of the top 1%, even way back in 1980, was quite a bit more than the median. Um, as a mathematical rule, right, the top 1% will be higher than the median. Um, but the difference was not very significant, uh, especially relative to where we are today. Right back in 1980, the top 1% had an income of about 350,000. The median Oregonian, the typical Oregonian, was sitting at right about 35,000. When we fast forward almost four decades to 2018, uh, we find that the uh, income of the top 1%, the average person in that group, uh, more than tripled to about $1.1 million, while the typical Oregonian increased about $4,000, right up to around $39,000. And when we disaggregate and we break up that top 1% to the very richest 0.1%, which is the richest one in 1,000 Oregonians, and then keep the rest of that top 1% as a separate group, we really find that it is the very richest Oregonians that are driving this growth in income inequality. And so in this chart, what you see in the light blue line is the top 0.1%, those very richest, um, compared to the rest of the 1% in the dark blue. And... <laughs> uh, Whereas they were sitting at about you know, 900 and so thousand um, back in 1980, this richest one in every thousand has jumped all the way up to around $5 million in average income in just the 2018 tax year. Um, and this, <laughs> that means that there's literally, uh, this is a group of about 1,800 taxpayers um, who have driven the growth and in income inequality for our state as a whole and have left so many uh, of the rest of us behind. Thinking about this another way, um, the richest, you know, as I mentioned, the richest top 0.1%, that richest one in a thousand, made a little over $5 million in a single year, right? And what this chart shows is how many years would it take for the top 1% and for the median Oregonian to also make that $5 million, right? And so here we see the top 1%, it would take them a little over four years. For the median Oregonian, that typical Oregonian in the middle, and keep in mind, median means if we were to line up all the Oregonians uh, based on their income, the person standing right in the center is the median. So this median Oregonian, um, with half of, half of Oregonians making less than them in a year and half more, would take about 129 years to make as much money, uh, to make $5 million, whereas the top one, 0.1% uh, does it in, in less than a year. And then here, sticking on this concept of the median income Oregonian, the typical Oregonian, we see again that in 1980, they made about 35K in a year. In 2018, they made about $39,000. Now, if instead of inequality growing at the rate it did and the rich capturing such a large share of economic growth over the last four decades, if instead that growth in Oregon's economy was shared proportionally uh, so that income inequality did not grow over those four decades, we would have expected the typical Oregonian's income to be about $62,000 not $39,000, obviously a really significant growth uh, in that income amount. And then thinking about this in, in another way, um, income inequality is really bad in Oregon, right? Such that 
the top 1% earned more than the entire bottom half of all Oregon taxpayers. Uh, not just more, but um, about $2 billion more in just the 2018 tax year. And so one of the things that's really obvious and really uh, apparent when we're looking at this suite of data on the growths over time, uh, on the very richest and on the rest, is that again and again, what we find is that income inequality continues to grow in Oregon, and that at least by some measures, income inequality in Oregon is now at a record high. So I'll pause there and see if um, Alejandro uh, or Juan Carlos had something that they were going to share. Well, I think it's important to try to understand how we got here. And I wonder, Juan Carlos, if you could weigh in on a little bit of the history uh, that led us to this, place, this point. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that it's, uh, in terms of how we got here, I think it's, it's pretty clear that we, we didn't get here by accident. It's the result of deliberate policy choices over, over many decades. Um, you know, and by policy, you know, we mean the rules that govern the economy. So, you know, if you go back to the middle of the 20th century, what we see is an economy that was delivering the benefits of economic growth much more broadly than it is now. Uh, you know, we had a much more secure middle class, much greater levels of economic security. Although I, I should... I should pause for a second and sort of point out that we don't want to romanticize this period, uh, you know, too much because it was also a period when um, Black Americans and people of color were largely excluded from the benefits of economic growth and that broadly shared prosperity. And 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 that those exclusions, you know, the the effects of those exclusions are still being felt to to the present day. Um, nevertheless, the 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 many of the policies that were in place at that time were clearly delivering much more broadly shared uh, prosperity. And if we look at what the pillars of, of, of that structure was, I mean, it's not, not a big secret. Uh, I mean, and, you know, some of the main pillars were, uh, we had a much more, much stronger unions, a, a bigger share of, the, of, of workers belonging to a union, for example. We had much greater investments in the public sector. And we also had a, a much more sharply progressive tax structure, especially at the, at the federal level. So in terms of, you know, what happened to these structures, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, is, it's a story where the, where the rich were not content with being nearly rich. I mean, Daniel pointed out in, his, in some of his slides that, you know, in 1980, the tail end of this period of broadly shared prosperity, there was still inequality. I mean, the rich were, there were still rich people. Uh, but the rich were not content with being merely rich. And so, so they began to push for policies that dismantled uh, these structures that created that broadly shared prosperity. And I think that, you know, probably Warren Buffett, uh, you know, bill billionaire Warren Buffett uh, said, it, said it best when he said, you know, there is class warfare going on, um, but it's my class, the rich class, uh, that's waging the war and that it's winning. And that's really, I think, a really good summation of, of how it is that we that we got to to where we are now. Thank you, Juan Carlos. So, Daniel, um, we will be fielding questions here in a minute, and I invite uh, uh, those of you who have questions to submit them uh, via the Q and A uh, button on the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Um, I, I do see some uh, questions that are that are coming up. I'm going to ask this one from a panel since it's more of a technical question uh, for Daniel, and then I want to talk Daniel about some of uh, uh, the options that we have uh, from a policy perspective. Uh, but the question uh, from Karen uh, Williams is, how do you define or calculate proportionally as, if, uh, as in if growth shared proportionally based on hours worked, number uh, and the number in the household? Can you talk more about that? Yes, absolutely. Let me pop back up that slide. So here what we're seeing and what I mean by proportionally is we took the growth in Oregon's gross state product, right? So how much the Oregon economy grew between 1980 and 2018, right? And we took that factor, that growth rate over that time period, and we applied that to everyone's incomes, right? Folks that were at the median, folks at the very highest, to determine if, if the growth in Oregon's economy had been shared proportionally amongst all tax filers, right? Um, rather than the richest seeing such an enormous uh, growth in their income and the rest of us not, then what we would have seen instead was that Oregon's 
um, median income taxpayer would have actually reported about $62,000 in income. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Daniel. So thinking about what comes next or what we can do about it, how do we respond to the problems that we've identified through this analysis? What may be some of the potential approaches that um, Oregon can take? Let me jump in. I mean, I think that one of the things that's important to point out and what we can do about it is that, you know, income inequality and, and more broadly economic inequality, it, you know, it, it's a problem of a federal, it's a, it's a national problem. It's not, it's not unique. Oregon is not unique in any way, as folks will know, already know. Um, so at the end of the day, we need uh, very strong federal action to really shrink inequality down to size. And, you know, I think that we can look back at some of the things that work in the past to give us a sense of, of the way forward. What worked in the past, they don't have to be replicated exactly the same way, but some of the same themes will be applicable. So having a stronger stronger unions or at least workers with greater bargaining power to be able to push up wages, um, you know, greater investments in the public sector, uh, as well as um, more progressive uh, tax policies. And and progressive tax policy is especially important at the, at the state level. I mean, it, it, at the state level, we, you know, for us to invest more in education and healthcare and all the things that, that create economic security for Oregonians, we need to be able to raise that money. Uh, we can't deficit, deficit spend like the federal government does. So, so uh, at the state level, tax policy is really where the rubber meets the road. I mean, it's really uh, essential. Um, so maybe Daniel, you, you can you can walk us through some of the some of the specifics on tax policy, what we would like to see. Yeah, thank you. I think pop this back up. It's important to also understand. And sorry for any uh, whiplash from the uh, screen sharing and unsharing here. Um, I think it's important to understand like what our tax system currently looks like, right? Um, if you look at all of our state and local taxes in the state of Oregon and you combine them all together. What you find is that the richest 1% of Oregonians pays about 8.1% of their pre-tax income, while the bottom 20%, the poorest one in five Oregonians, pays over 10% of their income um, towards state and local taxes combined, right? And so this is what we call a regressive tax system. This is a tax system that actually asks a larger share of the poorest people's incomes than the very richest Oregonians, right? And what we think uh, and, and obviously, this is the kind of thing that, as was just pointed out by Juan Carlos, like it worsens and perpetuates income inequalities. If your pre-tax income, right, if the income that you're earning is unequally distributed, and then we tax them at different rates, uh, such that the top 1% ends up paying a smaller share of that income in taxes, then our tax system is actually worsening, not improving income inequality in Oregon, even with our reliance and um, amount at which we lean on income taxes as a way of funding our state. So the fact that we have an upside down income tax structure, I mean, uh, sorry, upside down state and local tax structure on net is really an important piece of context to understand what the solutions are. Because I think, as you pointed out, Oregon has an important play. Oregon's legislature and governor and policymakers have an important part to play in addressing income inequality. And the simplest version is we need to tax some people more and we need to invest in working families, right? And when we talk about some people, we're talking about those richest one-tenth of 1%, one uh, the richest 1%. We're talking about people whose average incomes are hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in some cases, right? So for example, one of the, I think, main ways to address income inequality uh, is to tax the rich, right? We know that they've grown over the last four decades in, in number, in magnitude and the amount of actual income that each one of them have available uh, to spend on whatever uh, frivolous or uh, meaningful investment they choose to spend it on. Uh, so we need to increase tax rates on our highest income bracket, right? People making over $250,000 a year. It's about the top four or 5% of all Oregonians. Um, we need to increase the amount they pay. Uh, they paid more just a decade ago or a little less than a decade ago after measures 66 and 67 and we should increase those tax rates again. On top of that, we should increase taxes on the very richest, right, on millionaires. People who make over a million dollars in a single year, we should add an additional bracket and we should tax them at even higher rates than people that only make $500,000 in a year. And then sort of building on this tax the rich perspective as well, there's a lot of pieces in our tax policy and our tax code that disproportionately benefit the richest households, right? 
So these, um, just one example is that Oregon has a set of tax rates that are specific to and are only usable by taxpayers that own a pass-through business, such as an S-corporation, LLC partnership, and um, meet certain criteria, they're actually able to get lower tax rates on their first $5 million in profits, right? And so this is a benefit that we know to get the full, you know, the, the max use of, you have to be in the top one-tenth of 1% because you have to have over $5 million in profits, right? And so we know that that's one example of a tax policy that costs Oregon something like $300 million in a single budget period, yet does disproportionately flow to high-income earners. And so, you know, increasing taxes on the richest, closing loopholes that disproportionately benefit those in the top 1%, one-tenth of 1%, are ways that we can really help address income inequality. It's also important to realize that many large corporations, when you tax large corporations, it's the shareholders and the owners of those large corporations who pay. And so, for example, uh, increasing tax rates on our corporate income tax will ensure that the largest corporations are paying more. And who actually ends up paying that is often going to be people who don't even live in Oregon, but own shares of Google or Apple, uh, who would then be uh, seeing slightly smaller dividends. And so we can help address income inequality in Oregon by taxing corporations as well. Another option uh, around taxing corporations is we can prevent some of their, or at least prevent them from cutting their taxes by shifting profits into overseas tax havens, right? Um, there are legal methods right now for many corporations to hide their profits overseas and reduce the taxes that they owe. Oregon uh, leans heavily on the federal system to address this, but there are changes that Oregon can make um, that would help reduce the ability for corporations to do this, or at least ensure that if they are engaging in these tax avoidance techniques, that we're still able to tax uh, their profits effectively. And then finally, we need to invest in working families, right? We uh, would be raising quite a bit of revenue through these tax the rich tax corporations ideas. We need to then invest those in services and programs that help the lowest income Oregonians afford the necessities like, for example, housing, uh, for example, food, um, healthcare, all of the things people need to be, um, to survive in our communities as well as thrive. But there's also ways that we can make the tax code itself more effective in addressing income inequality. And one of those is through expanding the earned income tax credit uh, to what are called ITIN filers. These are individual taxpayer identification number filers. Um, we can invest in and expand this helpful benefit called the earned income tax credit, which is a refundable tax credit that benefits uh, low income working families largely. And so this is a part of our tax code, a, a tax break that uh, does disproportionately benefit low-income folks, right? Um, there are areas in our tax code that do help working families, and the earned income tax credit is one uh, where we could really invest more to get real benefit um, in the working families that need the help the most. And by expanding it to these I-10 filers, it would help address one of the real um, holes in our tax system, because many I-10 filers are folks that are immigrants uh, to the U.S., and um, by expanding the EITC to these hardworking members of our communities, we'd help address some of the inequities that do exist uh, in our tax code. So I think those, I mean, uh, you know, it seems simple, uh, tax the rich, tax corporations, invest in working families. Um, in my long spiel breaking down each of those, hopefully you also uh, are all able to understand what are some of the very specific ways that we can actually make this reality. And, and certainly, as mentioned earlier, I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that's, that's very helpful. And we're going to get into some questions that, that folks are submitting. Again, if you do have a question, please submit it via the Q&A uh, button at the, uh, uh, the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, before we do that, I, first of all, I want to invite folks to sign up uh, uh, on our website, ocpp.org, where you will receive, if you haven't already signed up, uh, do so because you will receive uh, the kind of reports that we're talking about here today, as well as action alerts um, and other information that is relevant uh, to tax policy and economic policy in the state. So I invite you to sign in. I also invite you to contribute to our work uh, by becoming a recurring donor. Uh, and there's a donate button on the page. Before we go uh, into questions, uh, we have about five questions so far. Keep them coming. I will be... Uh, uh, reading those out loud and, and directly into our panelists. But uh, Roger, if you wouldn't mind putting up the first poll question, because this is actually kind of a pop quiz for our audience. 
and I want to invite everybody to answer it. The answer was already in the presentation. There's another way of thinking about it. And the first question we have for you is how much more would the typical Oregonian have earned in 2018 if inequality hadn't grown over the last four decades? Oh, most of you got it right. Uh, $23,000 would be uh, the additional uh, income that typical Oregonian would make if income inequality hadn't grown over the last four decades. So thank you for that. Um, I think it's interesting to think about it in that way or how long it would take uh, to make the same amount of income as the um, richest uh, individuals in our state. Um, I want to move, I want to pivot to um, some of the questions that we've received. Um, and I think uh, the first question, I think it's one that many, um, you know, are, we, we're asking ourselves and how we think about income inequality and the differences between populations. The first question from Peter Hall is, do you have statistics for rural versus uh, urban income disparity? And, and I want to add to that uh, whether or what we know about or what are the limitations in understanding um, how uh, populations of color fare very, uh, relative uh, uh, to this income uh, inequality that we're talking about. So, Daniel, do you uh, want to take that question? Sure, I can start us off. So, uh, in terms of income inequality data, um, we, because of limitations in our and the Department of Revenue's ability to share information that can be um, attached to a particular taxpayer, right? Because of the need to ensure taxpayer confidentiality, we do not receive the data set that we get statewide by certain um, geographies, right? And so we're unable to, with the data we receive from the Department of Revenue, break it down by geography. Um, the Department of Revenue does publish data on folks that earn over, I think it's 200 or 250,000 by county. Uh, that is one of the ways that we can say, you know, there are higher shares of folks in the top four or five percent in, um, you know, Multnomah County relative to uh, Jefferson County, let's say. Um, we did not do that analysis as part of this research, but that is um, one kind of path of, of analysis that we could consider in the future. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, really digging into the very richest like we did here is not something we can do geographically uh, here in Oregon. Um, however, we do know yep. that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Daniel. Sorry, I was just going to say we do know that um, employment rates, poverty levels, um, housing burdens, things like that are very geographically distributed. Um, we do know that there is disparities um, based on different part, parts of our state on various measures of whether or not someone's able to survive and thrive. Um, uh, although I don't have a lot of that data available. Maybe Juan Carlos did since he was going to. I mean, I, I know that, for example, the Economic Policy Institute has produced a report. Uh, I can't, it may, may have been updated in the last couple of years, but uh, it does break down income inequality, both at the, uh, you know, amongst the states and also uh, provides local data. And, uh, you know, th their data does show that, um, you know, I, if I recall correctly, that the, the most unequal place in, in local locality in the U.S. was Jackson Hole, Wyoming, you know, a, a tourist destination, but also some of the biggest cities, you know, uh, San Francisco, um, uh, you know, Boston, you know, New York can be extremely unequal just because you have both, uh, you know, some of the richest people living there um, as well as uh, uh, low income folks. So the biggest disparities can often be found in those in those urban areas. Thank you both for that. Um, I want to give it to a question uh, we have a couple of questions here that uh, raise the uh, one argument I think that we hear often when we talk about uh, increasing taxes for the rich or corporations. Um, and that is whether the, uh, the, the rich or, or, you know, income from the rich will leave the state. Um, you know, uh, another way to put it is, uh, you know, what, what happens? Uh, the fact that capital and wealth are mobile, the rich uh, can move to Washington or Idaho, for example. How do we respond to that? What's, what's, the, what's the reality of the situation? Juan Carlos? Yeah, and the, the reality is that we have a lot of data. There's been quite a bit of research on this topic. And the thing is that uh, the rich, rarely leave the state because of, of tax increases. I mean, it's not to say that it never happens, but, um, you know, on the margins, it's pretty insignificant. And I mean, I think in Oregon is actually like the perfect uh, example of that. I mean, we have here in Oregon um, an income tax, uh, you know, the highest bracket is 9.9%. Um, on the other side of the Columbia River in Vancouver, there's no um, income tax. So uh, if taxes really mattered, uh, 
Portland would be a, a ghost town. Um, we also know, uh, for example, that uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Oregonians enacted Measure 66, which raised uh, the income tax rate on the, on the, on the very richest Oregonians. Uh, and even after that, um, Oregon had the biggest growth in the number uh, of millionaires anywhere in the country. Um, so we know that um, taxes really uh, don't matter where people choose to live. And there's a fascinating book out that explains sort of the reason why, and it makes a lot of sense, which is that you became rich in a certain place. You develop your, your networks, your, your connections, you built your business uh, in, in, in a particular place. And so it's not so easy to just pick up and leave. Um, and so you're really grounded. Your, your income and your wealth is grounded uh, in a particular place. So um, again, there's, a, there's been a lot of research on this point, and it's clearly a, a talking point of those who oppose raising, having more progressive taxes, saying the folks are going to leave. But, but the data really shows that that is not, not a real concern. And one thing I want to add to that um, is when we think about less taxing the richest, but also taxing businesses, right? Often people will assert that if you tax a particular business, um, that they will just go ahead and move to another state. Oregon has a tax system for corporations where we only tax based on the sales that occur in the state of Oregon, right? And so if a business um, moves its you know, production facility from uh, Lake Oswego to Jackson Hole, um, but keeps selling the same amount of stuff in Oregon, their taxes don't change, right? And so there's no incentive because of how our tax system is structured for businesses uh, to change where they locate because of either of the uh, suggestions we have around corporate taxes, increasing the rates or um, uh, preventing them from hiding their profits overseas. Because both of those will apply to businesses based on what they sell in Oregon. Uh, and since this is something that's a share of profits, um, if you're making money on a sale, uh, getting slightly less money doesn't disincentivize continuing to sell, right? There's still that incentive for businesses to sell as much as they can. Uh, for a profit in Oregon, regardless of some, you know, modest increase in the corporate tax rates that we use. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, continuing along the lines of how do we talk about um, some of these policy proposals, one question uh, from Maggie is, the, you know, how do we bring communities along with the idea of progressive taxes? Or in other, you know, more specifically, as you put it, what are the best ways to respond to the trickle-down economics arguments that people bring up about taxing the rich? Who wants to take that one? Juan Carlos, you want to take the first crack? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, a lot of the polling that they, that we've seen over the years, both at the state and, and national level, are pretty consistent in that a, a really solid majority um, of of people support progressive taxation. They believe that the rich in corporations are not paying their fair share and support it. And so the last time that we saw at the ballot box a true progressive tax measure, um, you know, measure 66 and 67, the measures won handily. Now, I can't remember how it did in, in, in rural areas, uh, but I think that there's still a, a, a good deal of support for progressive taxes. Perhaps the thing to do is also acknowledge, um, as Daniel sort of discussed earlier, that we do have an upside down tax structure. So people may not necessarily you know, differentiate between income taxes and say excise taxes that they pay or uh, you know, other forms of taxes. So perhaps pairing uh, a progressive tax a proposal with, a, with a, you know, a, a boost of the earned income tax credit that reduces taxes at the bottom and raises them at the top, perhaps that could make it politically more viable. But I, but I, I think that um, it would be interesting to to see where rural Oregon is specifically on a true progressive measure that, you know, clearly only only hits those at the top. And I think, I mean, just to add on to that as well, that people are interested in raising taxes because of what it buys, right? To be explicit, if we're not investing in our communities with the tax revenue in a way that people care about and people will see, then they're not going to be very interested in it, right? We need to invest in people's communities. The reason we need to raise revenue, right? Uh, is to address income inequality, is to help people survive and help people thrive. Uh, and so making sure that we're spending that in an effective way, in a way that people can really tangibly see and understand, uh, is often really crucial for tax measures to be successful. I mean, there's a reason that the Student Success Act 
um, that was put forward in the last legislative or last long legislative session uh, was not even challenged at the ballot, right? It's because people found it was popular. These were investments in pre-K, in culturally specific education opportunities in our schools, in our neighborhoods that were going to help address issues of mental health, access to school meals, and many other things um, that made it popular, right? It's because it was investing in our communities. Um, people weren't excited about the fact that it was a corporate activities tax, right? Um, the funding mechanism was secondary. Thank you. So we've talked about the uh, earned income tax credit um, as a policy approach to addressing uh, income inequality. Um, obviously, that's, uh, that's one of the many tools in a, in a, in a long list of uh, you know, tools <laughs> in the toolbox. But uh, another one that we've heard about is the fairness tax credit uh, concept. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that is and how does this fit into the sort of overall picture of uh, income inequality? Daniel? Sure. The fairness tax credit was an idea that came up during the Student Success Act negotiations. And thank you, John, uh, for the question. The idea behind it is that many Oregonians um, who do file taxes or, or are low-income uh, Oregonians or no-income Oregonians um, don't necessarily benefit from some of the policies in our tax code today. And so, for example, the earned income tax credit focuses on people who earn income, right, who have a job. Uh, Oregonians, perhaps, who are retired or are unable to work for other reasons, um, they would not receive very significant benefit from the earned income tax credit. The fairness, the tax, uh, the fairness tax credit idea was really centered around ensuring that the largest benefit was going to those with the lowest incomes and that it did not care uh, how much income you, uh, or, or that you had earned income or a certain type of income to report or that you were working. It was just a tax policy intended to um, help distribute some of the proceeds from the commercial activities tax, sorry, corporate activities tax, uh, out to all Oregonians. Uh, unfortunately, it did not make it into the final piece of legislation. Instead, they went with cuts to certain personal income tax rates. Um, we, we would have liked to have seen it gone the other direction, um, but we appreciate that, uh, that the fairness tax credit is still an idea um, somewhat similar, although far from identical to uh, universal basic incomes that is worthy of further conversation and discussion and evaluation as a priority uh, for the state. Sandra is, uh, makes, makes a very good comment here on the, uh, on the Q&A section. She says, you know, you refer to hardworking families, but racism has made sure that some work three jobs and still can make it. Uh, we've addressed a little bit of that issue, but clearly uh, there is a significant inequity in uh, the amount of work put uh, by certain families, and that's a structural element. Uh, one thing that um, I wanted to move into is, you know, how do we advance some of these uh, policy uh, priorities? Um, and uh, Lee um, asks whether we're suggesting that we should aim uh, to fix the unequal tax system through citizen initiatives, as opposed to calling in on uh, the legislation to do it. Uh, Juan Carlos, uh, what's your take on our approach or on the approach that Oregon should take? Well, uh, you know, tax policy is complicated and, and getting it right uh, does require deliberation. So uh, citizen initiative uh, is not always the best vehicle. So I, mean, I think in an ideal world, we would have, um, we would move forward through the legislature, but we do, it's also important to recognize that we fair, face a significant hurdle in terms of raising tax rates. We contend with a supermajority requirement. Um, so simple democracy does not rule when it comes to tax policy in Oregon. Um, it's a situation where the minority rules. Um, so it's, it, it's a tough situation. And sometimes, um, you know, we are left with no option but going to the, to the ballot. Uh, but, but again, I think in an ideal world, it, it, tax, pol tax policy should be something that's dealt with through the del deliberations of the legislature where it properly belongs. Thank you. Happen, I, I would just good. happen to have a couple legislators on this webinar. Uh, I won't out you specifically by name, but just know that we are uh, working with lawmakers to try to advance uh, more progressive taxes for the 2021 legislative session. Um, we know that we got a revenue forecast recently that made our current uh, revenue and budget crisis a little bit less bleak. But when we look out to the next biennium, we are still um, more than a billion dollars, billions potentially, depending on how you count, uh, short of where we were uh, thinking we would be just at the end of the 2019 legislative session. 
So there's still an immense need for Oregon and for the legislature to fund um, services that Oregonians depend on and paying for those services by taxing those who have the resources, who have seen their incomes you know, quadruple uh, over the last 40 years are exactly the right people to uh, target. It's possible that Alejandro might have frozen. Um, I think we'll uh, keep moving through um, as best we're able and, and he can rejoin us um, when his face is no longer stuck. I see one uh, additional question kind of in the following in the same vein as uh, the prior question of why OCPP hasn't led or sponsored a ballot measure to raise taxes on the rich. Um, you know, as a research organization that does advocate for outcomes, we often partner with support and really work to try to advance those ballot measures and those legislative proposals. Um, we do also, though, lean on our partners at other organizations to help um, figure out the right campaign plans figure out the right messaging and, and the right ways to be successful at raising taxes on the rich to fund the important needs that the state has. So we often prefer to and look to collaborate and work in cooperation with our partners to address um, ballot initiatives or other legislative campaigns. Um, although that doesn't mean that there isn't a world in the future where OCPP is listed as a petitioner on a ballot measure or an initiative to raise taxes on the rich. Um, although I, I can say with some confidence that is not currently expected to happen anytime soon. We also have a, a comment from our question from Ashley. It says, during recent online gatherings of the Oregon Business Plan, the leaders have expressed support for an agenda that will create greater shared prosperity and will support economic mobility. Their programs had a, have had a particular impact on BIPOC small businesses. The discussions on these online programs have not yet moved to discussion of the actual policy proposals. They will support accomplishments accomplish these outcomes. I'm curious if you're hearing about policy proposals where there might be some common ground with OCPP. So I guess it, just to sum it up, or, you know, do we have a common ground with the Oregon business plan, Daniel? Have you, have you looked at it and, and do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it is a good question. Um, and we are often hoping for and looking for opportunities for us to collaborate uh, with members of the business community, uh, either through the Oregon business plan, uh, through Businesses for a Better Portland, which I think Ashley has some affiliation with, um, and other, um, particularly uh, chambers representing specific communities of color around the state. So I think we're really uh, interested in and would love to find opportunities for greater partnership uh, with the business community in addressing some of these um, important needs the state has. There's often agreement, and, and to be clear, I mean, to answer your question more directly, um, I haven't heard about some specific policy proposals that, um, that we would be uh, willing and interested in supporting. Um, I haven't heard of any we're, we're interested in opposing either. So I think that we're looking forward to opportunities for further collaboration. Um, although I will say that in the past, there's often agreement on the spending, right? Um, you know, the, there's rarely disagreement on the fact over the last decade or two that we need to invest more in our K through 12 education system, right? Um, people in the business community, people uh, like OCPP agree about that. Um, but how do you pay for it? Right. At the end of the day, how you fund the important investments that Oregonians need is often areas where it's uh, a little bit harder to find that alignment with members of the business community. Um, although I do remember it was just a couple short years ago that uh, the Oregon business plan actually included a suggestion that we should reform the kicker and put the kicker resources into, I believe it was the Education Stability Fund, um, which is a rainy day fund used to support K-12 through education funding. Um, we would love to, uh, the kicker, oh, and I should say before I dive into the wonky part, uh, the kicker, Oregon's kicker, is an automatic tax uh, rebate that occurs when Oregon's uh, state economist uh, underestimates revenues by 2% or more um, a couple years ago, right? And so it's a, it's a flawed, foolish policy that sends the vast majority of the kicker dollars out to the highest income tax holds. I think it, the last kicker was something like fourteen or $15,000 on average went to the top 1%, while um, you know, the typical Oregonian got a couple hundred dollars. Uh, so I think it's, um, there are opportunities for collaboration uh, and we always would love to find um, some of those unusual partnerships to advance uh, the outcomes we all want, right? Which is in Oregon uh, where low and middle income uh, people are thriving. If, if I can uh, sort of add here, sort of, uh, I have not looked at the Oregon business plan. I've looked at the most recent one. I have seen it in years past and, and there are some policies that, uh, that we 
sometimes find agreement with. Uh, uh, and again, as Daniel said, we would love to find those opportunities. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, when it comes to questions of tax policy uh, and how you ultimately pay for the services that Oregonians um, uh, both need and deserve in, ter in, in terms of improving the quality of life, we have not seen the business community say we need progressive taxation and we will put our weight behind it. That is something, and in fact, they take usually take the opposing side, either opposing closing very regressive tax loopholes or opposing raising uh, tax rates on the rich, which is ultimately, you know, as I mentioned before, tax policy uh, is really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to the question of uh, addressing income inequality and addressing the, the funding needs uh, of public services. And so, the, you know, you know I, I may get in trouble for saying this a little bit, but, uh, you know, it sort of reminds me of, there was a, a famous, a, a really famous episode at a, at a Davos meeting, uh, economic forum meeting, a couple of years ago, where where a Dutch historian was invi invited to a panel, and you know he ultimately said, you know, when it comes to dealing with questions of inequality, you know, unless you're talking tax policy, the rest is just BS. And you know, I I think that ultimately, you know, we, you know, unless you're talking about dealing with the inequitable inequities in our tax structure, the rest is 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 you know, it's on it's addressing problems on the margins. I see a question um, here about how the pandemic's likely to impact the patterns of inequality. Um, <laughs> it, not in a good way. I mean, if there's one thing that's been exceptionally clear from the data on who's uh, lost their jobs on the impacts um, to different income groups, I mean, the, off the Oregon Office of Economic Analysis did a great job of, of showing very clearly that the richest uh, third and the middle third of Oregonians um, have mostly recovered, right? That, that in many ways are not in particularly terrible straits. But that bottom third saw the greatest drop off in job losses when the economy was shut down and have failed to recover many of those jobs. Uh, these are also the very same people that are less likely to have you know, health insurance during the pandemic, or less likely to have savings to rely on if they do lose their job. These are the same people that unfortunately our federal government's letting down by not extending unemployment benefits further, right? Um, so the pandemic, the federal response to the pandemic um, are certainly likely to perpetuate and worsen economic income inequality, uh, I would expect. Um, the other piece, too, that's kind of interesting that we found in, in looking at some of the data nationwide is that some of the very richest people in our nation, right, the billionaires, um, Oregon only has a couple, but those we do have have done um, very well since the pandemic struck. Uh, if I recall correctly, Phil Knight's you know, net worth has grown by billions um, while we as a state are staring down billions in uh, potential deficits for an upcoming budget period, um, and while you know tens of thousands of Oregonians remain unemployed. So I think that um, if the simple version, I guess, is that uh, the pandemic has, has worsened economic income inequality would be our prediction, although we're certainly um, both excited and distressed to find out what the data really shows. Oh, there's a new question. What incentives or other than moral ethical reasons do the 1% have to support these kinds of tax changes? Or perhaps equally important, what policies can be changed that keep the 1% from using their wealth to fight against policy changes? Do you have some thoughts on that, well, Dan? I'll maybe start with the first half. Um, economic growth writ large, right? The, the entirety of Oregon and of our national economies will grow faster, will provide greater value for everyone in the long run if we reduce income inequality, right? If we increase the ability for low and middle income Oregonians to gain higher levels of education, more profitable employment, start their own businesses, survive crises without having to you know, enter bankruptcy or sell their homes, those will all help boost and help stimulate economic growth in the long run. And so from a purely economic standpoint, there are advantages and benefits to having a more equal society um, and at least a more equal, equal distribution of incomes such that the very richest don't have, you know, a uh, hundred times plus more an average income than the typical Oregonian. I, I would add that, you know, it's, you know, there's been studies that show that, uh, you know, you reach a certain level of income where your basic happiness does not increase. And so, just having more money doesn't necessarily make you happy. Not that that will necessarily convince you that you ought to oppose rising income inequality, but at least 
um, you know, from the perspective are, you know, is the is the is the rich person better off? Uh, not not in terms of measurements of of, of overall happiness. Um, and you know, another another point to make is that income inequality, you know, as income inequality rises, political instability also rises, and that is and that is not necessarily something good um, uh, in the long run for uh, for the rich. It creates a much more uh, potentially uh, you know, unstable and even, you know, potentially a violent uh, situation. So um, it's it's not something that uh, uh, that one can can look forward to. There's one other question um, that I did see pop up. That's a great opportunity to I, I think emphasize and create a little bit of clarity as well. Um, I think for us, the top action items are the three that I listed. Um, we need to increase taxes on the rich. We need to increase taxes on corporations. And we need to invest in working families by expanding the earned income tax credit, right? Those are three approaches that we really hope we'll see action, that we're working to see action on in the 2021 legislative session. Um, and so it's certainly, uh, you know, if you're looking for areas to engage and areas to, you know, speak with your lawmakers, to talk to your friends about, share information about, I'd really recommend those three approaches as the ways to address income inequality and really help set the state of Oregon on a, on, and, and, our, and her um, peoples on a path towards shared prosperity. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, my apologies, uh, we had technical difficulties on my end. Uh, so I missed uh, the last uh, 10 minutes of the conversation, uh, but I, I, I know that you were in good hands. Um, I think this is a great uh, time to uh, wrap up uh, the questions and the webinar. I want to thank everyone uh, for attending today. Um, I think uh, that uh, your questions really reflect um, the issues and concerns that we have uh, heard from others. Um, and we want to continue to engage with you uh, in making sure that we can advance uh, the um, policy items that we have um, uh, raised here today. Uh, and we invite you to be part of this uh, policy change that we hope will lead to structural change uh, and ultimately uh, a more equitable society. Um, again, I invite you to sign up to our list at ocpt.org. And uh, if you're able to um, show your support uh, through your donation, uh, becoming a recurring member is easy to do. Uh, and uh, please keep an eye out for uh, announcements for future webinars. Uh, we'll be talking more about our 2021 agenda. Uh, and uh, we will continue to engage uh, via this format in other virtual events. So please keep an eye out uh, for that and invite you to join us uh, now and in the future. Thank you very much. Take care.